everyone in this room is affected one way or the other by the creative economy. It could be what you wear, the music you're listening to, or the movies that you're watching. This panel is going to be talking about the things that affect the growth and development of the creative sector uh, in Africa. I want to start with Ayana. Um, so in 2016, you were part of the global team that created the global uh, strategy for expansion of Amazon across the world. And Africa was one of the touch points that you uh, definitely uh, identified. How does it feel to be the person now, not just envisioning, but actually executing that strategy? And what do you think are the opportunities for growth across the creative sector in Africa? Um, well, it feels uh, fantastic to be part of that team. I mean, um, as mentioned, we, uh, from a prime video standpoint, we embarked on a global expansion. Very, it was the very end of 2016, and for the past sort of year and a half to two years, we've been building upon that foundation and sort of ramping our, our service across all aspects, content, product, accessibility in sub-Saharan Africa more, more specifically and more constructively. So it's, it's very exciting to be part of that team. And I think there's, from a, a creative economy standpoint and from a, a media and entertainment and a sort of a, a premium film standpoint, I think there's nothing but opportunity. The, the biggest opportunity and one of the most wonderful things about sub-Saharan Africa is there's no shortage of good stories absolutely no shortage of good stories. And part of our strategy is to help showcase and bring those stories forward, not just for the benefit of our customers in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also our customers, our 200 million Prime Video customers in and around the world. So I think there's a ton of opportunity. I think there's a ton of opportunity to, to, to help elevate and showcase stories. We always say for Africans, by Africans, for a global audience. And, and those things, I think, directly and indirectly help help to cultivate this sort of creative economy with regards to premium, premium and film entertainment that originates in sub-Saharan Africa. OK, and, and just quickly as well, what do you think about the fund? What kind of funding strategies do you have for crea creatives on the continent I mean, from an Amazon standpoint? Well, from an Amazon standpoint, we, we, I guess, we acquire and fund content uh, um, uh, in a number of different ways. We have a number of different economic models, economic models that we employ, whether that's license of finished product, whether that's commissioning uh, content, whether that's co-productions uh, that we enter into, or, or things like output deals. For example, we have a number of output agreements that we've entered into with Nigerian filmmakers and studios where we, we become the global home of their entire theatrical output, their entire slate in a given calendar year. So those are just a number of examples of the types of models that we use as a way of working directly with content creators, filmmakers, be it in Nigeria, South Africa, other parts of the continent. But we use a number of different models and means to sort of acquire the content and really support the creative output of those filmmakers and content creators. Mm. Mm. So, Mogi, I mean, on your side, you, you do a different kind of funding. Um, you're more in philanthropy. Uh, what, what challenges are you facing? Uh, you also did this great study with USC around this, the, you know, how black people, Africans, are represented in, in media. What, what are your thoughts around that model? And what kind, of, uh, what kind of funding do you need for the kind of things you do? OK, so let me start. Africa No Filter, that's the organization that I, I represent. We are a um, donor collaborative, so we fund um, storytellers who can give a different perspective about Africa because I think it's really important if you look at how most people know America it's not by reading you know, Pentagon Papers it's by watching Top Gun you know that's how you so film plays a very powerful role right in influencing so we fund storytellers and one of the big sectors we fund is film but our funding is very small so what we've actually done is that we, we have something called the last mile film fund which is really for filmmakers who have run out of money because filmmakers tend to invest in their production and they forget they need to get to festivals and do a bit of marketing. So that's actually where we play. Mm -hmm. But we also play with you know, pretty much small, and I'd say emerging filmmakers. And I think the biggest challenge that I feel that they have and what we constantly get asked for beyond funding is connections connections to markets, you know, how do they kind of get their films out there, you know, what festivals should they be at, how do they, you know, get licensing deals. So money is great, and I think, you know, Amazon, if you could film, you know, fund every filmmaker in Africa, it'd be fantastic, but you can't. <laughs> so, you know, the other thing that we can help, and the biggest thing, like I said, we, people need is connections. We need connections to, you know, <coughs> America, you know, big film markets where they can actually start making money from their content. I think it's amazing. Please, you, you can put your hands together. For me. I think I think it's amazing because platforms like this actually. I mean, have you guys connected today? Anybody? Any deals? No one. 
Well, we should ask, how many creatives are in this room? Yeah, how many, how many, how many creatives are here? Don't even be scared. Put your hand right up and wave it in the air like you just don't care. I mean, come on. And how many of you connected with anyone significant at this conference? Anyone? All right, cool. We'll talk 10%. 10%. Okay. All right. So, so but Denim, I mean, I, I think your perspective is unique because you're in front and behind the camera. Yeah. Uh, you're doing some amazing work. Uh, who's watched Yellowstone? Anyone? So that's the guy. So if you want to take autographs <laughs> after this. But I mean, but seriously, he's doing yeah, great work with, uh, <laughs> I catch the play. with the production side. My question to you is this. Um, if there's one thing that would change the landscape, mm -hmm. right, in film, in creative industries on the continent, what would that be? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. For me, it's uh, a big focus is capacity, right? Um, we have to have the capacity building aspect, but then we also have to have access. So oftentimes what you find of being on the continent is you get great organizations, great companies that come in and they will kind of give these motivational speeches, right, about what the potential on the continent is. And if you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you can do anything that you want. And it's like, not really, right? <laughs> like, this is not really true, but it feels good. Uh, so the realities of it is, is are we focusing on the capacity aspect or are we so busy trying to be competitive right now that we're now like mortgaging the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road? So if we have the capacity aspect that's happening and then we also are able to then say, here's the pipeline, right, for actual job opportunities mm -hmm. from that. Now there's actually starts to be a little bit of an ecosystem, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Aside from just saying, oh, yeah, come learn how to do something. And then if I come and I learn, what's my reward? Right for learning, right? Because there's still not an infrastructure yeah. that's built yet. Yeah. So one of the things that we really work on at Kumo, which is based in Botswana, is really having the television film aspect, but then also spending a some significant amount of time with the capacity because I was one of those people as well, right? Growing up, you learn how to do something. I'm like, okay, great, with all this information, mm -hmm. What do I do with it? How do I get opportunities? So capacity building mixed with then the access to me are the, the top two things. And then, of course, the financing aspect. But no one's going to finance you if you're not able to even know what to do with that money. Right? right? So, yes. So, I mean, um, uh, for you, Uzo, you, you've been, you, you run the Africa Center. Uh, that means everything around Africa is on your plate in a sense. Um, <laughs> Big shoulders. Film producer, beast of no, uh, no nation, and um, so many things. Now, my question to you is this. Is this creative economy thing, is that a fad? Is it a bubble? Is it the, uh, is it the magic wand that waves all the employment issues on the continent away? <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts about that? I feel like you're setting me up. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I'm going to approach this with the hat of being a novelist, which is what I do first and foremost, which is not exciting to most people because being a novelist is not a way to make any kind of money at all. Let's just be very honest. And I start there because I think all too often we, we go, those two words when it's in, uh, we're talking about a discussion about our continent, creative economy, like they just go right together and everybody just starts to ooh and ah. And what I want to do here is not say that there isn't a pathway but it is to make the case for uh, creativity as creativity mm. and to disaggregate it from this idea of economy. Not, and, and I think it's really important because not everything that you do creatively has to have an economic benefit. And in fact, sometimes the benefit for your creative ideas or your creative production won't be realized until 5, 10, mm. 20, 30 years into the future. Yeah. We have to think about the importance of stories and ideas as stories and ideas. And that, the power in that, to actually shape and shift culture, mm. shape and shift society, and, and help us realize our true, our true selves and power. And so when I think about how I write, and I recognize there's a certain luxury to that, but you, know, you think about Chino Achebe writing uh, Things Fall Apart, I doubt that he was writing for a big advance at the time because nobody wanted to publish any kind of African book at the time. He was writing for the power of the idea, the ability to tell that story of a different society before mm. colonialism and that interaction with colonial authorities. That's so powerful. That book has sold almost as many copies as the Bible and has transformed the way that everybody thinks about our continent, whether you're in Nigeria or Botswana or Kenya. Mm. Ngugi Wationgo, same thing in terms of his ideas. So I just want to move us away from creative and economy together as a thing that we always have to talk about as Africans. 
yes, money is important, but it's not just money. Our power also resides elsewhere. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I would clap. To that. that was great. Uh, so, Moki, uh, quick question. So, you recently did a Creative Vibrancy Index, mm. uh, 12 cities across uh, Africa. What did that tell you about the creative landscape on the continent? Yeah, we, we did this index to actually try and figure out, you know, we talk a lot about this creative economy and how important the creative industries are, but what is, what is actually happening on the ground in terms of creativity? So what we did, we looked at sort of three areas. One was, you know, creative economy, one was cultural vibrancy, and one was enabling environment. And we took the 12 cities and we looked at things like, for example, how many theaters are there? How many screens are there? I mean, in, apparently in America, there's something like 40,000 mo movie screens. In Africa, there's 1,000, right? So when you start thinking that we're trying to build a film industry, yeah, where are people going to watch it? You know, we're assuming everyone has television access to Netflix or Amazon. That's not the case in Africa. So we were looking at things like, you know, where do people actually consume cultural outputs, that's one. We're looking at the enabling environment. For example, where can people learn technical skills? You know, films, you know, I used to act, I know that there was a hundred, you know, hundred people on set. There would be like maybe 15, 20 actresses and all the rest of those people are technical background people, project managers, technical people to allow us to get that content out. Where are they getting their skills from, right? So we looked at things like that and it showed us there really is an issue with where people are learning about creative technical um, skills. And you refer to the word capacity building, and I'm actually gonna tell you, I hate that word, because that implies that you know, we're doing something to help you, we're building your capacity. It's a very development mm. speak. Mm. You, know, you don't call New York Film Academy a com capacity mm. building a ca you know, mm. school, it's not. Mm. They're teaching skills. Mm. That's what we need, we're mm. teaching skills, and that's what we found. We need, we need more technical skills you know, to build the ecosystem. So when Burner Boy you know, releases his album, he's recording everything in Africa, right? It's not doing it in America and then just selling to us. We're not, we should be more than a market. So the, the Vibrancy Index, I'll tell you who, which city was ranked top. It actually was Johannesburg across all three, enabling environment, creative economy, um, and cultural vibrancy. Mm -hmm. um, the second was Cairo, and third was Lagos. And Lagos was on there primarily because of Nollywood because of its creative economy, because there's a lot of outputs and there was like, you know, industry, there was trade, there was exchange with cultural products. Mm. Um, and actually Cairo won overall for um, enabling environment. Amazing. Uh, when you look at the landscape of the creative economy, I mean, it's like a buzzword, right? Everyone's talking about creative, creative, creative. Um, I don't think there's ever been this, uh, this amount of funding available for the sector. I mean, AfriXM launched a $1 billion fund um, I know that the AFDB did a $600 million fund as well. Um, Amazon has given us money as well, and many other people. Um, and the question really is this. How come with all these funds available, people can't access any of these things? Because you find that there, and there's a, there's a problem around monetization of IP itself. What are the things we need to do to ensure that IP is now the same value as a building or as a piece of land? Because that's always been a, a problem with how you can access the funding itself. So any ideas is open to, to the, the crew. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Uzo, okay, you can go. Yeah, Uzo wants I, to go. I feel like no, go, go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, I mean, but you're saying it, you're right. Uh, you know, IP is a $2.2 .2 trillion industry, right? And so that's like, that's massive. Mm. And so, I. I when you speak to a lot of people on the continent, they have a tremendous amount of stories, right? Um, but the biggest thing becomes like, how, what's that nexus point? How do we have access, right? The industry in and of itself is very much like a club, right? So it's like, it's very easy, like once you're in, it takes a long time to get in there, right? Um, and so it becomes a little bit easier to maneuver. But then when you look at what the submitting process for, you know, for your projects and how long that takes, right? And then how much money you may be able to get from that. And yes, once you have now decided that finally there's uh, an opportunity to get your stuff on a platform, mm. you don't own it anymore, mm. right? And then, so then what is that benefit, mm. right? So then that comes back to the whole creative aspect of it. It's like, I'm doing it to create it, but then I also want to be able to now have an opportunity to monetize. Exactly. Exactly. 
But now I don't even get to really monetize it in the same way because you'll own it for the rest of your life and you'll monetize it, right? So something I sat on for 10 years, you get to take it and then perpetuity, you get to have it. So it becomes one of those things where I feel like that's where entrepreneurship really comes into the play, where you have to start engaging these different sectors outside of just the television and film sector Mm -hmm. because they have will have a completely different outlook on the way that they maybe they just want to splash around a little bit maybe they're not as interested in the ip aspect they just want a good roi Mm. right and then that becomes a little bit interesting right so i think that there's a way to have both but i think the ip thing on the continent is a massive conversation Mm. right because that's one of the biggest issues that so many people are having so i feel like we have to do like here in the u.s that creative financing opportunity right when people want to go buy a house i feel like you have to we have to get a little bit more into the creative aspects of how we can do things on the back end Mm -hmm. of television and film and making sure that our people are not being taken advantage of from that standpoint. Can I just to to add to that, and I think you mentioned like AFDB and After XM. Mm. I think even they will tell you that for the funds they put together, you know, and and they're they're awesome, but they'll tell you themselves that they do big infrastructure deals. Mm. They do, you know, like oil, they do, you know, like roads. And the way that you think about financing those is very different it's from the way that you think about Facts. financing film. Mm. And so, you know, they, the, there's, a, there's a, a need to shift to understand exactly how, you know, within that space of, of IP, how that's done. And I don't, think, um, I don't think when you, you know, we'd like to throw out the big numbers, right? But we also have to realize that those numbers and the way that people think about those numbers may not fit for mm. the, the current state of the place that we're, we're talking about. That's one. I think, too, um, you know, it, it often, you know, again, we get very, I think we shift the discussion to film and television and, you know, like when we talk about creative economy, but you and, you know, we were all talking about this before, that it is more expansive than that mm-hmm. and that there are other ways and other things of thinking about. So if you want to talk about the expanded creative economy, if you're talking about fashion, right, that's distribution, supply chains, agriculture growing, like there's a whole other aspect around that. And the IP then becomes, is it just the designer sitting in a studio Mm. who is, you know, cutting their fabrics? Like that's really, really important and not to knock, but are there other aspects Mm. of that that we're not also thinking about Mm. um, that are actually equally as important as part of this discussion? That's just something that I think Mm. we should really bring in. Mm. Okay, Uh, and Ayana, do do you you want to jump in? No, no, I mean, I think, I mean, I, quite honestly agree with almost everyone's comments. I mean, I think the only thing I might add upon that is even, even I think, uh, you know, from my experience, and I work with a number of, you know, uh, you know, content creators across the continent, even to to broach a conversation about IP ownership, Mm. there's still a baseline level. I'll call the, you'll use the word infrastructure, Mm. right? The number of times when literally I've been having a conversation and I may ask about something called, you know, chain of title. The reality is some of these (laughs) concepts, and maybe they're sort of legal concepts, but they're IP ownership concepts as well. There's still an opportunity to help invest and like educate and understand and and provide and build that type of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Some things that are are already more, a little bit more mature and like whatever Hollywood, maybe Bollywood, what have you. But I think there's some opportunity there. So I I don't, I agree with really the comments that everyone has made, but I'll just say that I actually think to really dig into and have constructive conversations because I think the premise of some of the comments is that maybe like it's kind of exploitative from a Mm. distribution standpoint. That's not always the case, Mm. but there, I think there does need to be this more investment in sort of baseline things that really help ground a creative industry, at least again, in the film, the media and entertainment Mm. space, things that we take for granted and other, you know, sort of market segments around the world that I think are really important to help protect for for all parties Mm. involved, quite honestly, Mm. in, in, from a sort of transactional standpoint and make sure that those things are there. There's, so there's some opportunity there as well. Yeah, I, to- I totally, just to add to that, I definitely, uh, and I totally I agree with you, right? It's like we, there's, there's that educational aspect, right? And this is one of the things I am very, very big on for me personally is you have to know all aspects of entertainment. And like it's a creative economy, it's the entertainment sector is the only sector that actually employs all sectors, right? It is agriculture, it's attorneys, it's accountants, it's all of these different things and so it's like how do we begin to tie that nucleus and there is there's ways to be able to come in to have it to these bigger corporations and be able to say if we have the right knowledge and information we can have an entirely different type of conversation as well
well, right? So it's about how are we positioning? What things are we doing? As people that understand this, what are we doing in our everyday to make sure that we're able to make sure that we're bringing those people in and not just saying, let's foster your creativity yeah. when we also know that there's a whole business element, right, that we need to get you prepared for as well. Yeah. So as much as we talk about the, you know, focus on your passion, if you focus on your passion in uh, too much, yeah. sometimes depending on what you want to do, because it's all about really what you want to do, right, yeah. that might make you poor. Right. So like you have to really you really have to get into a space where you understand I'm yeah. passionate about something, but also at the same time, mm -hmm. I need to understand all the business aspects. I need to understand the business upscaling mm -hmm. and then get myself around the right people so that I can make sure that I'm being fostered in the right way. And, and, and you see, and that's precisely why the creative economy is so powerful, because it's not just about the creatives. Mm -hmm. um, if it was, I wouldn't be sitting here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't do anything. But. But I do understand the business. I've been an intellectual property lawyer for 20 years. I understand the ecosystem. I understand how the deals are done. And so when you think about the um, domino effect of a successful show, you're thinking about hundreds of producers, uh, craftsmen, fashion designers, makeup artists. So it's a big, it, there's a lot of flow through that. And I think what's amazing about the, the, the creative industry is that it's not driven by government. Mm -hmm. So maybe we don't need government, mm -hmm. but we do. Mm -hmm. Because we need to get the policies right. Um, so think about if you, you're going to shoot a movie and you know that there's a 25% tax credit in, say, Accra, then it makes more sense to shoot in Accra than go to mm -hmm. Mongolia, mm -hmm. for example, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we engage and how are we in our own spaces engaging with government to get the right policies, mm -hmm. to get the right lobbying? Because you see, they do not really care about you until they can see the flow through of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing to, to, to enhance that in our respective spaces? As we round up, we have maybe eight more minutes. I'll take We're one or two questions. We're going to be right on the dot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I really just want to address that because I feel that particularly in this environment, it's always about you know, like policies, what can government do to help? And we've seen the success of Nollywood. It wasn't government that helped there. Mm. And I think as an industry and a sector, I think creatives need to mobilize. We need to mobilize ourselves. You know, for example, when we talk about IP issues and maybe a network is, you know, like, I, it actually happened to me. We sold something. They have my IP in perpetuity forever and ever and ever, not for 10, 15 years, forever. Now, if I went negotiating as an independent filmmaker, if I had gone as a sector, a bunch of filmmakers, we would have had some leverage Back. that network because then we stop all content. We won't give you any more content. And maybe that's what's happening with the screen um, writers, mm. um, Thing right now. Exactly. And I feel that as an industry, we need to mobilize collectively, not individually. And I think Lovely. that's the challenge for us as a continent. We do a lot of things. And maybe creatives, we don't really kind of, you know, the idea is like we don't really want to kind of like get together. But I feel that that's something we need to consider mm. doing. And so, I think government so, needs to so provide the, us. The thing so, I like about Moki's work, though, and what you do is that you make that more possible because you do something that people aren't doing, which is collecting that data about stuff. Mm. Which is, you know, a lot of conversations are had without real understanding of, of you know, like some, of, some of the data that's out there. And so, you know, we're working on that project around media and representation. But, you know, with the one you, were you guys, what, how many, it was like 700, 7,000 films or something that you went through? Yeah, we, I mean, for, for this one about how Africa's covered in, in the U.S., it was 700,000 pieces of, sure. in, of, of content we went through that had Africa in it in some way. And, right. you know, and the results of that showed us that there really is a problem in America with how Africa's perceived. Mm -hmm. so, right, you know. and so if you want to talk about changing policies, right, if you want to talk to people about how, how think people are represented, if you take that data and you say, mm -hmm. okay, this is what's going on. If you take the vibrancy study that mm -hmm. you've done yeah. and you say, hey, listen, if you want to have a functioning sector, you have to look at this, 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 and this. Yeah. Here's Cairo, here's Johannesburg, here's Lagos. Where are you, Nairobi? Mm -hmm. right? Nairobi's that's quite a, low down, actually. Right, you see, as but the that's Kenyans a, found out. When it's a very different discussion with yeah. the policymaker mm -hmm. than it is like, oh, we need to have a creative economy. Mm -hmm. Right, because you know? they're also not approaching it from a creative thought process, exactly. right? They're, they're approaching it from a business and economic standpoint. So you have 
have to change the entire narrative. You can't just come in and say we need to have a creative industry because we're passionate about it, <laughs> right? Like it's just not exactly. Enough. And I think that's one of the the challenges on the continent is oftentimes policymakers do look at creatives as like a bunch of like adults that just never wanted to grow up from as being children, right? So they just like want to keep running around and playing make believe, and it's yeah. like no, there's a real economy here, right? Yeah. So like, how are we approaching this conversation from like let's just put the passion over here, right, yeah. for a second, and then let's come in and part of that as filmmakers is that is being creative right so how can you come into an environment that's not necessarily conducive to your everyday life mm -hmm. and change it yep. right and make that creative and so part of that is don't look at it like oh I'm trying to go and be government or I feel like I'm selling out it's like no you have to find more creative ways and more creative opportunities mm -hmm. to be able to do that so you can use data you can talk about how IP is a 2.2 trillion dollar industry mm -hmm. and as, as businesses they want 5% any good business this one's five percent. What's two point two trillion? If you can get five percent of that, what would that do for the GDP of a country, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So now all of a sudden that becomes interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So it becomes getting more people that are in that side yeah. of it yeah. that I think might be able to help undergird a little bit more. Yeah, I'm all right, great. Well, well said. So <laughs> yeah, you can clap. You can clap. You can clap. It's like, what are we gonna um, do? Gotta win. <laughs> so uh, we'll we'll go. We'll take maybe two questions. We have two four minutes, and I'm going to be very strict. Uh, but but one thing you said, which is really critical, is that. Uh, creative people collaborate when they're creating, but they don't do it when they're doing business, mm. right? Mm. And that's very important. So we're business people, we're creative, but without the business, without the business, there's no show. So we need to think about how we get the right professionals mm. to do our business plans, to do the mm. research, okay. and put that together. Mm. Uh, I'll take two questions. Uh, I will always take a lady first because I was raised properly. Um, sure and the only here. lady here is okay, her, and then I'll take a gentleman. <laughs> okay, but 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 There's so many of them they're raising yeah. their hands. So. so I'll take a gentleman in the back, OJ. So please go ahead. First of all, thank you very much, Roger. What a stunning panel. Um, so you were talking about connections, um, and I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, Amazon, are you connecting the dots here? Ooh. I'm sorry. I said you were talking about connections earlier mm. on, yeah. and I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, I hope Amazon sitting there is connecting the dots. Yeah, should we, we have her number, yeah. we're like, <laughs> yeah. I think that's what she's asking, right? Like if we connect. That was crazy. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Guys, uh, I'm sorry. Amazon's official what? PR representative. Yeah. <laughs> we have their, yeah, we're all in the WhatsApp yeah, group yeah, now. No. They're gonna okay. talk in turn about our quick. flight um, to JFK. Gentlemen in the back. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if, if, if we're as quick as she is, I can take two more questions, so. <laughs> that was great, we yeah. need so, more questions yeah. like that. Um, I'll, need, I'll take a lady uh, on this side, if there's anyone, okay. then I'll take you, sir. Yep. Uh, the question is that uh, uh, you know everybody is aware of the potential, and also the uh, American as well as African public wanting to see more of uh, African movies and features and all that. But uh, you know the African movie business has been dominated by Nigeria. Mm. Is it a good approach that we have only one cluster supplying to everyone? Or should we, should we have a very dispersed, distributed kind of a film industry, or OTT, or a, a satellite uh, television industry? Uh, because uh, uh, going by Netflix and Amazon, anybody who has the uh, ability to have a HDMI cable is in a position to see anything that he wants. That's not a problem. But here we are talking about uh, helping the creative minds. Because that helps. I'm a professor by profession. I love the uh, whole point of uh, educating people, getting them creative, getting them yeah. to enjoy their life. So I was going to so say, which is the best I, don't, I don't have any problems with being dominated by Nigeria <laughs> as a Nigerian. <laughs> but I think, I think, I think, but to your, to your question, I think the point of, of, I think two things. One is there's what gets a lot of attention just because of volume, mm. but that's not to discount what people are doing in many other places. And also remember, if you think about the Nigerian film industry, it's not just Nollywood. There are other places where other films are being made, Countywood, for example, right? And then think about other places across the continent. So there is the story that's put up that's headline and that gets attention because of cash flows, whatever, all that sort of stuff. And also because Nigerians are just loud people. Um, <laughs> it's not the way loud, wow. it's just a lot of us. <laughs> but, the then, but, then the, but then there are other places where there's really amazing creative work getting done. And then mm -hmm. I think to your point, how do we make sure that we are creating platforms and systems where everyone can, 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 can come up? Yeah. And can I just comment? I mean, I do know, uh, again, Nollywood, 
is probably, I think, the most prolific after Bollywood. I mean, larger than the Hollywood, uh, you know, then there are things like Connie Wood. Mm. My own perspective is that the rising tide lifts all boats. And I, I don't look at it as sort of mutually exclusive. If, Nolly, if content that originates in Nollywood, um, so I, 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 yes, it's more prolific from an output and a volume standpoint, but there's wonderful content that originates in South Africa, mm. Kenya, Morocco, mm. Ghana, I mm. mean, you know, so, Kenya, mm. I mean, so many different countries yeah. in a different way. So yes, I don't think it's, it's not like negative, and I don't think the fact that, that Nollywood has been so prolific with the actual volume of output, it sort of detracts. I just think, quite honestly, that the more content that originates on the continent that gets showcased you know, for a global audience, and again, an audience on the continent, the rising tide will lift all boats. So I think it's all beneficial um, and sort of um, mutually supportive, but not necessarily, I don't think Nollywood detracts from other uh, content that originates. And, okay, use a great uh, uh, model. I know we're leaving, but Nigeria also <laughs> used a phenomenal model, which is they understood that we can make a feature film for twenty-five thousand or for seventy thousand. They put it out there into the world, and people would laugh at it. But they, this was a way that they were learning. So they used great marketing. We're able to get out mm -hmm. into the thing, and this is part of the thing. So not every single time you want to create a project, do you need ten or fifteen million dollars to do it? So mm -hmm. I think this is that kind of rising tide about we can also learn some of these models in these creative. Of opportunities that Nigeria has used mm. as well. And he's from Botswana, so. And I'm from Botswana. So it's cool. Um, one more person and then we're, we're out. Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is OJ, and by the way, I'm Nigerian too. <laughs> of course. All right, so my question is we've spoken about expression of creativity, we've spoken about the business side of the expression of our creativity and our work. How about the legal angle? Nobody is talking about the legal aspect of the business of expressing our creativity. I'll give you an example. Well, wait, so let's take it from there, because I know these guys have got to get off. They've got flights yeah. to catch. So why don't yeah, we go yeah, ahead? Yeah, they, from, have yeah. so, they have to. So yeah, we have to. So basically, just one question. What, yeah, that's what the so question. it's the legal question. How about question? the legal yeah. part? Yeah. Yes, the protection yeah, go ahead, go ahead. of yeah. the creativity the, the, okay. yeah, that we the, carry. But I think that's a conversation, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's a really like, broad question. We yeah. have to have a conversation yeah. about like IP, IP protection, but then also this is what she was bringing up about doing more in the investment of teaching the more of the business side of it. I think maybe you came in a little bit late because we were talking about yeah. this in the beginning, yeah. is investing more, not only just in the creative industry, but a lot of the back end things right okay. so investing in teaching in the lawyers and the accounting and teaching artists yeah. to become more like business people as well but I don't so I want to leave I, that to I you guys. Can I just quickly say what one of the things that we do it's been very popular in terms of adding more to just our grant making is that we're teaching skills right so it's things like how do you make yourself a sustainable creative and one of the sessions we had is we had a lawyer on to come and explain about the legal side we've had people come and talk about how to apply for money, how to keep a budget going, you know, simple things, because creatives have to be business people just to be sustainable.